At last, we come to the daring class of destroyers built for the Royal Navy. They'd be a rather large class of destroyers, with a full load displacement of 3,600 tons or more. To give some perspective to the size of these destroyers, they'd be nearly four times the size of the A-class of destroyers built for the Royal Navy at the start of the interwar period, of which we have discussed in a video. I will try to remember to put it into the description. Anyway, I will be using Dr. Clark's amazing book, Tribals, Battles, and Darings, the Genesis of the Modern Destroyer, for most of my information. Dr. Clark opens up the section on the Daring class by describing some important aspects of the class, and in describing how radar and electronic warfare systems would be incorporated. He writes, Most importantly, these were destroyers designed with radar and electronic warfare systems as a central core around which the ship would be built. As such, they could well be described as the first truly modern destroyer. It is important to note that some of the 1944 batch of battle classes would be modified into the Darings in the following post-war era, with halls being lengthened, and in others, the slip numbers and materials which had been allocated would be transferred. Two would be completed to the original plans for Australia. Anyway, I think a good place to start is why were these destroyers built, especially with some in the Admiralty fretting over the size and cost of these vessels. Much like the Tribal class, these ships were thought as being different than destroyers, having more capabilities. With this in mind, for much of their service lives, they would not be counted as part of the Royal Navy's destroyer strength, but in a category of their own. Another important aspect of the Daring class is that some wanted to return to building smaller, fast torpedo attack-oriented ships, but no one could make up their minds on what would be cut out so this could be possible. Reducing one aspect of the ship would upset one group, like for example, if the engines were reduced, the fleet air arm would be upset because the new vessels could not keep up with the fleet and screen their aircraft carriers. With different groups wanting to build smaller and cheaper, easier to build ships, it would come at the cost of the capabilities of the ships. Next, with the end of the war, specialist ships were not as necessary as during wartime. So with this in mind, what the Admiralty needed was, quote, a well-armed, all-arounder, proficient for anti-submarine work, but equipped with anti-aircraft firepower and the capability to destroy surface or land targets, end quote. The Darings would come equipped with a new Mark VI twin 4.5-inch upper-decker UD turret, which did not penetrate the deck, of which the standard design would be based around the three main turrets, something I made note of in my video on the battle class, a return to having an aft turret. Anyway, with these, the Darings would have anti-air, anti-surface, and anti-land capabilities, with the rest of the ship being built around them. By the 1950s, the Mark VI could fire shells up to 14,000 yards, at an elevation of 80 degrees, and 21,000 yards at 45 degrees. These excellent weapon systems would necessitate the best possible platform for them to live up to their capabilities, with the dimensions of the ships to be that of destroyer proportions, as defined by the needs of the guns, of which they had previous designs and ideas to look back on. Being a modified form of the battle class, being fitted with stabilizers, with an underwater profile adjusted for better support for the sonar. The above shape of the hull calls back to the tribal class, with their angles and rake. Along with this, their 54,000 shaft horsepower and 34 knot top speed are provided by new engine designs by the engineers at Parsons and Marine Engineering Turbine Research and Development Association, of which the propulsion would be provided by two units comprising a double reduction geared steam turbine, driving one propeller each. Steam came from oil-fired water tube boilers, one per engine unit. Depending on the ship, the engines were provided by either Babak and Wilcox or Foster Wheeler, with the maneuverability of the ships being provided by two large rudders. There would be eight ships in the Daring class, but more accurately described as two four-destroyer subclasses due to issues with training and power supplies, with the Daring, Delight, Defender, and Dainty being fit with a then-conventional 220-volt direct current power supply, while the Decoy, Diamond, Diana, and Duchess were fitted with a 440-volt three-phase alternating current, due in part because they were the largest class to be built post-war, and with the number of new builds for the Royal Navy being limited, it meant the constructors would have limited opportunities to trial new ideas. If the fleet had to be changed again in the ever-evolving modern world, they would need those ideas to be tested somehow. Another aspect would be the fact that one of these vessels would be ordered on paper at least in 1945. The Delight, however, had been ordered in 1943, originally being ordered as the battle class Ypres. The first daring would be launched in 1949, with the last not being launched until 1952, while commissioning would take place between 1952 and 1954. In this ever-evolving modern world, the daring class would be built in peacetime for both war and peacetime duties, which can be illustrated by some of the features found in the class. 
with an electric galley, fluorescent lighting, and laundry being quite expensive things for ships that were still to make use of depot vessels, where normally destroyers would get a lot of life necessities done. With these facilities, the Darings would take on the cruiser role of diplomacy, which the basic idea of it is either being a deterrent or to shape potential conflicts. Something we discussed in a video on the tribal class, with the tribals possibly taking on a cruiser role in the defense of the empire. These facilities are augmented by the three structures found on the vessels, the first being the step forward structure, containing the two stag 40mm weapon systems, the forward Mark VI turrets, and the large open bridge, something new as previous destroyers had their bridge based on the design of the 1936 H-Class. The principal director, as well as the base of the tripod mast, rise high above all of it. The forward funnel would be inside the lattice main mast, and a quote from Tribals, Battles, and Darings, the genesis of the modern destroyer, quote, Lines were solid, angled, and stylish, demonstrating a great attention to detail, all of which sent an important message, that if a nation was prepared to invest in appearance, imagine what it would invest in fighting. The next thing found on the ship was the first quintuple torpedo launcher. Following this, there would be the middle structure, which housed the second funnel, and the single non-stag twin 40mm mount. Then another quintuple torpedo mount, and at the back, there would be the aft structure, housing the auxiliary director and the third Mark VI. The last thing between the structure and the stern was the squid anti-submarine mortar. Again, quoting here, These ships were built to be statements just as the tribals, together with the town and county class cruisers had been. It is a feature of ships expected to perform naval diplomacy. Many in the Admiralty would see the displacement of these destroyers as an issue, wanting to reduce the deck heights to save weight. These calls would come from those whose careers would revolve around cruisers and battleships, but the designs for the Darren class would be protected by successive third sea lords and the former sea lord, Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser. But getting back to some other important design aspects of the ships, they would be equipped with an evolution of the electronics equipment found on previous classes. As the Royal Navy had limited funds to spend on raider systems, and some of the earlier versions had been used in the tribals in combat, and they had a good track record thus far. Also, it was good because it meant that there would be less risk in a very high-risk area. Something akin to the old phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just to summarize the discussion on the Daring class so far, I'd like to give a brief overview of the ship's designs and the ships themselves. Starting off with the ships, there'd be the Daring, being laid down in 1945 and commissioned in 1952. Diamond being laid down in March of 1949 and commissioned in February of 1952. Duchess laid down in September of 1945 and commissioned in October of 1952. Defender laid down in March of 1949 and commissioned in December of 1952. Dainty laid down in 1945 and commissioned in February of 1953. Decoy laid down in 1946 and commissioned in April of 1953. Delight being laid down in June of 1943 and commissioned in October of 1953. Finally, Diana being laid down in July of 1948 and commissioned in March of 1954. The ships would displace a little under 3,000 tons normal displacement and a full load displacement of around 3,600 tons. Having the machinery in place to produce 54,000 shaft horsepower, giving the ships a top speed of around 34 knots. Now, their main armament would consist of six 4.5 inch guns and three twin turrets, two forward and one aft. Their anti aircraft armament would consist of two stag 40mm weapon systems and a single twin non stag 40mm mount. Along with that, they would carry two quintuple torpedo launchers and a squid anti submarine mortar. Now, in the 1950s, which is a little beyond what we normally cover on the channel, the Royal Navy was trying to outline how they wanted to use their new class, and it so happens an outline from 1953 exists, and I'll be reading it from Dr. Clark's book. In a future war, daring class ships would be required A, for use in screen of British carrier striking forces, Atlantic Squadron, and for inclusion in light surface action forces when needed. B, at the spearhead of light forces to seek out enemy light forces destroyers and below, in the Scandinavian area and Turkish waters. For such a role, their organization as separate units working as light cruisers is more appropriate than the standard destroyer squadron organization. To employ them so at present helps to offset the shortage of cruisers in commission, a shortage that cannot be remedied while manpower remains acute. Throughout this time period, the class would fill in at far-flung stations across the empire, notably to the Far East Station. I think the way that Dr. Clark closes out the section on the Daring class is an appropriate way to end the video. He writes, Conceptually, the ships of the Daring class were heirs to the tribal class, 
They had destroyer proportions and were almost built to a light cruiser's bearing, displacement, and scale, with the ability to be a presence and carry out diplomatic as well as combat duties. End quote. If you've enjoyed this video, that's great. Consider subscribing and leaving a like. Also, please go check out Dr. Clark's YouTube channel. He does some great work there, and I'll link to it down below. But to truly close things out, go tell a loved one that you love them.